Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video with your friends and family and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Is the Bible Word of God? Start of Chapter 8 Most Objective Testimony The Christian propagandist is very fond of quoting the following verse as proof that his Bible is the Word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Holy Bible, 2 Timothy, Chapter 3, Verse 16, from A.V. by Schofield. Note the is's in capitals. Reverend Schofield is telling us silently that they do not occur in the original Greek. The New English Bible translated by a committee representing the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Methodist Church, the Congregational Church, the Baptist Union, the Presbyterian Church of England, etc., etc., and the British and Foreign Bible Society has produced the closest translation of the original Greek, which deserves to be reproduced here. Every inspired scripture has its use for teaching the truth and refuting error, or for reformation of manners and discipline in right living. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The Roman Catholics in their Douay version are also more faithful to the text than the Protestants in their authorized version. They say, All scripture, inspired of God, is profitable to teach, to reprove, to correct. We will not quibble with words. Muslims and Christians are agreed that whatever emanates from God, whether through inspiration or by revelation, must serve one of four purposes. 1. It must either teach us doctrine. Two. Reprove us for our error. 3. Offer us correction. 4. Guide us into righteousness. I have been asking learned men of Christianity for the past 40 years whether they can supply a fifth peg to hang the word of God on. They have failed signally. That does not mean that I have improved upon their performance. Let us examine the Holy Bible with these objective tests. Not far to seek. The very first book of the Bible, Genesis, provides us with many beautiful examples. Open chapter 38 and read, We are given here the history of Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we derive the names Judea and Judaism. This patriarch of the Jews got married and God granted him three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah, when the firstborn was big enough Judah had him married to a lady called Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Genesis chapter 38 verse 7 Under what heading from the above four principles of Timothy will you place this sad news? The second, reprove, is the answer. Er was wicked, so God killed him. A lesson for all. God will destroy us for our wickedness. Reproof. Continuing with this Jewish history, according to their custom, if a brother died and left no offspring, it was the duty of the other brother to give seed to his sister in law so that the deceased's name might be perpetuated. Judah, in honor of this custom, orders his second son Onan to do his duty. But jealousy enters his heart. It will be his seed, but the name will be his brother's. So at the climactic moment, he spilled it on the ground, and the thing he did displeased the Lord, before he slew him also. Genesis chapter 38 verses 9 and 10 Again, where does this slaying fit into Timothy's tests? Reproof is the answer again. No prizes are offered for these easy answers. They are so basic. Do wrong and bear the consequence. Onan is forgotten in the book of God, 
but Christian sexologists have immortalized him by referring coitus interruptus as onanism in their books of sex. Now Judah tells his daughter-in-law Tamar to return to her father's house until his third son Shilah attains manhood, when she will be brought back so that he can do his duty. A Woman's Revenge Shila grows up and is, perhaps, married to another woman. But Judah had not fulfilled his obligation to Tamar. Deep in his heart, he is terrified. He has already lost two sons on account of this witch. Lest peradventure he, Shila, die also, as his brethren did. Genesis chapter 38, verse 11. So Judah conveniently forgets his promise. The aggrieved young lady resolves to take revenge on her father-in-law for depriving her of her seed right. Tamar learned that Judah is going to Timnath to share his sheep. She plans to get even with him on the way. She forestalls him and goes and sits in an open place en route to Timnath. When Judah sees her, he thinks she is a harlot because she had covered her face. He comes up to her and proposes. Allow me to come in unto thee. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? He promises that he would send her a goat kid from his flock. What guarantee could she have that he would send it? What guarantee did she require, Judah queried? His ring, his bracelet, and his staff is the ready answer. The old man hands those possessions to her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Holy Bible Genesis chapter 13 verses 16 to 18 The Moral Lesson Before we seek the heading from Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 under which to categorize this filthy dirty story from the book of God, I am tempted to ask, as you would be tempted to ask, what is the moral lesson that our children will learn from Tamar's sweet revenge? Of course we do tell our children fables not really for their entertainment value, but that through them some moral may be imparted. The fox and the grapes, the wolf and the lamb, the dog and his shadow, etc. However simple or silly the story, a moral is aimed at. Christian Parental Dilemmas Dr. Vernon Jones, an American psychologist of repute, carried out experiments on groups of school children to whom certain stories had been told. The heroes of the stories were the same in the case of the different groups of children, but the heroes behaved contradictorily to each other. To one group St. George slaying the dragon emerged a very brave figure, but to another group fleeing in terror and seeking shelter in his mother's lap. These stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character, even in the narrow classroom situation, concluded Dr. Jones. How much more permanent damage the rapes and murders, incests and bestialities of the Holy Bible have done to the children of Christendom can be measured from reports in our daily newspapers. If such is the source of Western morality, it is no wonder then that Methodists and Roman Catholics have already solemnized marriages between homosexuals in their houses of God, and 8,000 gays, an euphemistic term for sodomites, parade their wares in London's Hyde Park in July 1979 to the acclaim of the news and TV media. You must get that Holy Bible and read the whole chapter 38 of Genesis. Mark in red the words and phrases deserving this adornment. We have reached verse 18 in our moral lesson, and she conceived by him. Can't hide forever. Three months later, as things were bound to turn out, news reached Judah that his daughter-in-law Tamar had played the harlot, and that she was with child by Hodem, and Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burned. Genesis chapter 38 verse 24 Judah had deliberately spurned her as a witch, and now he sadistically wants to burn her. But this wily Jewess was one up on the old man. She sent the ring, the bracelet, and the staff with a servant, 
beseeching her father-in-law to find the culprit responsible for her pregnancy. Judah was in a fix. He confessed that his daughter-in-law was more righteous than himself, and he knew her again no more. Verse 26 It is quite an experience to compare the choice of language in which the different virgins describe the same incident. The Jehovah's Witnesses in their New World Translation translate the last quotation as He had no further intercourse with her after that. This is not the last we will hear about in the Book of God of this Tamar, whom the Gospel writers have immortalized in their genealogy of their Lord. Incest Honored I do not want to bore you with details, but the end verses of Genesis 38 deal with the duel in Tamar's womb about the twins struggling for ascendancy. The Jews were very meticulous about recording their firstborns. The firstborn got the lion's share of their father's patrimony. Who are the lucky winners in this prenatal race? There are four in this unique contest. They are Fares and Zara of Tamar by Judah. How? You will see presently. But first, let us have the moral. What is the moral in this episode? You remember Ir and Onan, how God destroyed them for their several sins? And the lessons we have learnt in each case was reproof. Under what category of Timothy will you place the incest of Judah and his illegitimate progeny? All these characters are honoured in the book of God for their bastardy. They become the great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers of the only begotten Son of God. See Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. In every version of the Bible, the Christians have varied the spelling of these characters' names from those obtained in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 38, with those contained in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, to put the reader off the scent, from Pharez in the Old to Paris in the New, and Zarah to Zara and Tamar to Tamar. But what about the moral? God blesses Judah for his incestuous crime. So if you do evil, her, God will slay you. If you spill seed, Onan, God will kill you. But the daughter-in-law, Tamar, who vengefully and guilefully collects her father-in-law's Judah's seed, is rewarded. Under what category will the Christians place this honor in the book of God? Where does it fit? Is it your 1. Doctrine, 2. Reproof, 3. Correction, or 4. Instruction into Righteousness? Ask him who comes and knocks at your door. That professional preacher, that hot gospeler, that Bible temper. Here he deserves a prize if he can advance an explanation for the correct answer. There is none born who can justify this filth, this pornography under any of the above headings. But a heading has to be given. It can only be recorded under pornography. Ban the book. George Bernard Shaw said that the Bible is the most dangerous book on earth. Keep it under lock and key. Keep the Bible out of your children's reach. But who will follow his advice? He was not a B.A., a reborn Christian. According to the high moral scruples of the Christian rulers of South Africa, who have banned the book Lady Chatterley's Lover because of a tetragamation, a four-lettered word they would most assuredly have placed a ban on the Holy Bible if it had been a Hindu religious book or a Muslim religious book. But they are utterly helpless against their own holy book. Their salvation depends upon it. Reading Bible stories to children can also open up all sorts of opportunities to discuss the morality of sex. An unexpurgated Bible might get an X rating from some senses. The plain truth. October 1977 Daughters seduce their father Read Genesis 19 verses 30 to the end and mark again in red the words and phrases deserving this honour. Do not hesitate and procrastinate. Your coloured Bible will become a priceless heirloom for your children. I agree with Shaw to keep the Bible under lock and key. But we need this weapon to meet the Christian challenge. 
The Prophet of Islam said that war is strategy, and strategy demands that we use the weapons of our enemy. It is not what we like and what we do not like. It is what we are forced to use against the one book, Bible. Professors, who always knock on our doors with the Bible says this, and the Bible says that. They want us to exchange our Holy Quran for their Holy Bible. Show them the holes in the holiness, which they have not yet seen. At times these robots pretend to see the filth for the first time. They have been programmed with selected verses for their propagation. History has it that, night after night, the daughters of Lot seduced a drunken father with the noble motive of preserving their father's seed. Seed figures very prominently in this Holy Bible, 47 times in the little booklet of Genesis alone. Out of this another incestuous relationship comes. The Ammonites and the Moabites, for whom the God of Israel was supposed to have had special compassion. Later on in the Bible we learn that the Jews are ordered by the same compassionate God to slaughter the Philistines mercilessly. Men, women and children. Even trees and animals are not to be spared, but the Ammonites and the Moabites are not to be harassed, distressed, or meddled with because they are the seed of Lot. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 19 No decent reader can read the seduction of Lot to his mother, sister, or daughter, not even to his fiancée if she is a chaste and moral woman. Yet you will come across perverted people who will gorge this filth, Tastes can be cultivated. Read again and mark Ezekiel 23. You will know what color to choose. The whoredoms of the two sisters, Ahola and Aholiba. The sexual details here put to shame even the unexpurgated editions of many banned books. Ask your born again Christian visitors under which category will they classify all this lewdness. Such filth certainly has no place in any book of God. End of chapter 8